Hey, everybody. Uh, as we head into this episode, Grail, uh, we just kind of wanted to let you know that we got a little ahead of ourselves and we wound up recording this episode a couple of weeks ago before we got word that David Warner had passed away. So you're going to hear us talking about it this week and talking about him this week as if he's still alive, because when we recorded this, he still was. Uh, but with that said, uh, much love and peace to his family and rest in peace to the great great david warner we heap nothing but praise upon him in this episode jeff uh because he's so great and he's dearly dearly going to be missed um but with that said on to grail YouTube. we're mixing it up this week look we at that are. you turned your camera i did i'm using a different camera i didn't know that you had a picture of david bowie yeah, I've got a couple of side. couple of them actually. And then the Ramones up there. I see the Ramones one. And then who's this down by your roadcaster? Let's see. That's, that's uh no doubt right there. <laughs> right. There's no doubt. All right, man. Over here is a, uh, you can't really tell, but this is one yeah. of my old bands. Damn glad to meet you. That's one of our, uh, our okay. posters. Is that a guitar case right there? I've never seen this side of this just room folks. Yeah. Is that a guitar this case? Is, uh, no, this is where my headphones go. Oh, oh, yeah. It's pretty cool. That's huh? cool. Yeah. And then what's that you got your hand on? Is that that's your, my, uh, math oh, effect your, okay, okay. video game controller that doesn't work with my Mac, but I still he's, keep here. He's all about mass effect folks. I really am. I've got a confession, Jeff. All right. I'm not a David Bowie fan. No, no. My not wife is a, my wife's a huge fan of his music. Yeah. Um, I'm, I think, I think his music is, is, I think his music is brilliant. I don't necessarily enjoy it. If that makes sense. That's fair. Yeah. 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 I just think he was an art. He, he was one of those people who was a life artist. Like yeah, yeah, what yeah. he did with his life was art. And I totally respect that. I, I don't know a ton about him or his life from everything I understand about him. That rings true. Um, but just purely on his music, like, do I ever want to pop in his music and listen? And that answer is no. He's got a couple, but like, I think some of the stuff that's his best stuff, the covers of them are better. Yeah. Like one of my best, yeah. one of my favorite Bowie songs is heroes. You know, we okay. could be heroes just yeah, yeah. for one. And Jacob Dylan, I think maybe the wallflowers, but Jacob Dylan did a version of that. That's perfect. So much better. It's perfect. And yeah, I have a, I have an entire playlist on my phone that is, I call it covered up. Okay. Okay. Try, but it's, it's the songs where a band covered an older song, but they did it better yeah. than the original, you know? Um, and I've got songs in there. Like when Aerosmith did come together. Yeah. It's a better version. It is when it really Umford is. sons did the boxer mm -hmm. over Simon and Garth. my wife, Penny, we were laying in bed one day. We, we hadn't been married very long at this point. And I had that song as like my alarm. Okay. Yeah. Cause like you said, music to be your alarm. And, uh, so like we're laying, I think the phone was between us for some reason. I guess we just fell asleep like that one that night. And, uh, it comes on and like she wakes up and the first thing she goes is. When did Simon and Garfunkel learn how to play the guitar really well? Wow. <laughs> I was like, whoa. Wow. Was and she's a big Simon and Garfunkel fan. <laughs> like, she thought that's who it was. And I was like, no. Trivia point on David Bowie. Do you know yeah. who he was married to? I do not. There's a Star Trek tie-in. <gasps> married to Am it. Amon. Star Trek Six, the uh, shape changer. Right? Smoking the cigar. Turned into Kirk at some point when they're on Ruripente in Star Trek six, there's that shape changer. And when they, you look at, like, I don't never remember seen this. No, I, that's my favorite of the TOS movies. I I'm, know I'm drawing a blank on this. I know the Ruripente thing. So they're on Ruripente, right? And Kirk gets in fight with dude and right? that lady comes up and he's like, kick him in the knee. Oh yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah that lady yeah, who then yeah. is the shape changer. Yeah. That's yeah. a pawn who's married to David Bowie. There you go. Yeah. Okay. All right. So there's our first. <laughs> no, All right. For, because I know the folks at YouTube are dying to know the rest of my playlist. I'm going to read. I kind right. of am too, to be All honest. Right. Alan Jackson's Margaritaville. Okay. It's better than Jimmy Buffett's. It just is. Um, okay. This one may be a bit of a stretch, but I per it's my own personal playlist and I like it better. Alien Ant Farm's version of Smooth Criminal. I'm with you there. Yeah. They nailed Fall that. Fallout Boy's version of Beat It. Okay. Listen to it. Check it out. It's better. Uh, UB40's version of I Can't Help Falling in Love. Yeah, totally. Better than Elvis's. Sorry, King. 
Um, Israel Kamanawakawalo Olays somewhere over the rainbow is yep. way better than Pinocchio's version. Right. Uh, the clash. I fought the law. Right. Gr Green day did a great version of that too. Uh huh. Yeah. But, but I think you're right. Clash pretty. Cause they, yeah. Mm -hmm. Still mm -hmm. law. Yeah. Uh, Van Halen's dancing in the street. Did you know that was a cover? Yeah. Oh yeah. Totally. Yeah. Uh, Creedence Clearwater revival. I heard it through the grapevine. Also a cover. Yeah. Uh, run DMC's walk this way. Yep. Right. Um, Aretha Franklin. I'm going to tell you what was the song that was a cover that she did. Was it, was it respect? It was. It's re it's, I, I feel like I've heard that. Before. Res respect was a song written by a man. That's right. From a man's perspective. And when she took it, she put a whole different deal on it. Yeah. A uh, group called DC talk. I don't know how many people out there know DC talk, but they did a version of lean on me. That is the best version of that song I've ever heard in my life. Really? Yeah. I huh. love that version of lean on me. Uh, Pearl jam did the song last kiss, mm -hmm. right? Uh, disturbed did a version of sound of silence. That is bone chilling. Yeah. It moves your soul. Like it you, really for does. real. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, and then right along that same line, Johnny Cash's version of hurt. Yeah. From nine inch nails. Right. The video for that too. Uh -huh. I remember. Oh. Mm -hmm. Yeah. All right. I'll give you another one. See if you can figure out the one Elvis Presley. He did a cover and he did it way better than the original guy who ever did it. Okay. Um, God, they, they probably did a bunch of covers though. That's like, was the thing back then. I, I oh yeah. And a friend of yours wrote a song and you took it and whoever made it famous first, like you were just happy for each other. Yeah. 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 All right. I'll tell you hound dog. Who did that first? I don't know. I don't remember, but we looked it up and it's 100% a cover. Like that's iconic for him. That's, that, like, that's like his song. That was like yeah. his first song. Yeah. Huh. Yeah. Uh, Blondie doing the tide is high. Mm -hmm. Yeah. That's good. Kanye West doing stronger. Okay. I'll give right. You that one. Uh, bangles doing hazy shade of winter. Yeah. Mm -hmm. My, uh, my ska band in the nineties, we did a version of hazy shade of winter based on that version of hazy shade of winter. There's a lot to unpack in that statement. <laughs> you, you had a ska band? <laughs> Dude, I had a, I, I had a touring ska band signed to a record label. We were the schematics schematics. This would have been gosh, 97 ish to about 2001. Dude, I was a ran. huge ska fan back in that, that time period. Right so there. much. It was so much fun to play. It oh was, my God. As a drummer. Five Iron Frenzy, like, Bo yeah. Mighty Mighty Boss Tones, Real Big uh, Fish. Orange County Supertones, Real Big Fish. Aquabats. Like that's actually part of why I've got the no doubt poster down here is we, they're kind of in that vein, aren't they? Well, they're a bit more power pop, but they, yeah. their, their roots are totally in ska. And we actually played a ska festival with them. That right. sounds cool. We were one of like, they're probably but they 40, do, 40 bands. But no doubt has a lot of that upstroke yeah. on the guitar that, 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 that uh, ska uses a lot. Totally. Um, all right, let's hear, uh, Christina Aguilera, little Kim, Maya and pink doing their version of lady marmalade. Okay. I don't think we've Sorry, Patty LaBelle. It was, it was good. A uh, band of gold done by Kimberly Locke, which I thought was really good. Bobby Darren doing Mac the knife. Yeah. That was a cover. Uh, Pentatonix's version of hallelujah, by the way, one of the worst concerts I've ever been to in my life. We Fall out boys, Fall Out boys making the list twice here with their cover of what's this from the nightmare before Christmas. Okay. I've never heard that. Oh, good. Oh, really? so good. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Uh, all right. Two more. Blue suede's version of hooked on a feeling. Mm -hmm. Yep. Right. And then, uh, Quavenzane Wallace from the, the last version of Annie that got made. The one with Jamie Foxx. The one with Jamie Foxx. Okay. The one that, the one that retired Cameron Diaz as an actress. Did it really? Uh huh? Oh, wow. That was her very last movie. She'll never be an actor again. That's a good movie. I liked, I really but liked that take. Their version of hard knock life. Oh yeah. Yeah. That's so good. Good. So good. Anyway. Good. Guys, we're not here to talk about music and covers and all of That's that a podcast. Uh, we could totally do it. We're 10 minutes into this thing, man. We're here to talk about Babylon five. We're talking about the episode grail. Hey, did you got Jeff? Are we going to put that video out? That other video of the one? I think we, yeah, let's will it, it be out before we're, before they watch this one? I think we should put it out after. After, uh, well, I would say do it before. Yeah. 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 Do you think like a couple hours before? Or no, like or, put it out like on Friday, like on Friday. this episode releases on Monday or yeah. something like that. Okay. Yeah. That's what I would do. Uh, anyway. Yeah, totally. Yeah. Okay. Guys, yeah, I see. listen, it. go watch the 
uh, I, I recorded a live reaction to this episode and you guys can go watch me watching the episode. <laughs> it's so, not, it's, it's it, so weird to me, but it is cooler than it sounds like it, it's fun to watch him watch the episode. Like, it really is. <laughs> there you go. Thank you. Yeah, uh, yeah. I, I hope you guys like it. If you guys don't, if you're like, yeah, dude, this is totally lame. Stop it. Please tell me. So I don't keep doing it. Yeah. But if you guys like it, it's over there. It's on. We're going to put it on like a different playlist. I, yeah. I think that's what we're doing. Um, so we may be recording this a couple weeks early. Anyway, yeah, if you get uh, intel. yeah I think yeah. We'll, by the time this comes out, we're going to have our regular playlist. This is on, which is just full, yeah, full episodes. We're going to have our clips, uh, playlist. Oh, sort of episode that. Clip, yeah, yeah. Cause the, I think, I think we're starting those with, um, and the sky full of stars is when those start, Okay, which great. Yeah. And then, and then we'll have the. We'll call it Brent's reacts or reaction, yeah, yeah. something like that for the playlist for that. Yeah. One. We'll come up yeah. with a cooler name that you guys will already know what it is because we will have had a cool name. So yeah, you'll be like, you're talking about a thing that hey, exists, guys, you, knock it what, off. What do you think about that name that we came up with? Huh? Mm -hmm. Huh? Comment Pretty down cool. below and let us know. <laughs> uh, <laughs> all right. Hey, all of that out of the way, we're talking about the episode grail. Jeff and I've just watched it both for the very first time and we are here to discuss it dive deep into it this is our behind the scenes recording this is the show about the show we're recording the podcast that's going to go out on the audio feed later but honestly you're the main folks you guys are the main audience right here on youtube so this is all for you guys this is the unedited version you guys are getting the bloopers and the outtakes you're getting the conversations the rat the the rat trails no rabbits trails some there of them go. are yeah some of them <laughs> You're getting the rabbit trails that Jeff and I get off on and th those will get cut out of the final episode later, but you guys are getting all that because this is an unedited video and you're also going to get all the pauses because we can just push a button and suck those out and rather than nice. fill it in, it's really Magic. nice. Uh, but with that, Jeff, um, my audio levels are good. Are they sound good on my side? Are they okay for you guys? Great. There? Okay. Sound hopefully good. you guys sound good. Comment down below. We'll talk to you guys while the episode's going on and Jeff, if you're ready without further ado at 11 minutes and 32 seconds into this episode let's finally do what for we those of you do. still with us here we go and also just because my camera's here everything's backwards for me this week so this might be fun it's my first time first time Welcome to Babylon 5 for the first time, not a Star Trek podcast. My name is Jeff Aiken, and I'm watching Babylon 5 for the first time. And I'm Brent Allen, and I'm also watching Babylon 5 for the first time. Jeff and I are two veteran Star Trek podcasters watching Babylon 5, you guessed it, for the first time. And while doing this, we're going to take those skills that we've learned from overanalyzing 850 plus hours of Star Trek and overanalyze this whole episode or show, whatever this is, series, watching it for the very first time. And while this is not a Star Trek podcast, we got to remember that because we're going to go there. We're going to make those references. And so to help police ourselves, we have a fun game, one of many that we like to play. We each get three references, no more during this episode up until the point that we actually kind of compare the episode to star trek in a in a way we get three references if we make one you'll hear this and once we've used those three no moss jeff you know what i think we need to do what's up so for the folks out there listening on the podcast feed you guys are awesome Amazing. we love you we are recording this for you but Jeff, there's a whole other group of people out there. Mm -hmm. Those are our folks on YouTube, YouTube. And, uh, you know, I, so when we are doing this live on YouTube, you press a little button and there plays our intro music. But while that's playing, you and I are just sort of like sitting around taking drinks and looking at each other and, you know, we have a lot of talking and, to get ready from. Everyone. We do, yeah. we do. But I'm just thinking like for our YouTube viewers, maybe we should put together like an actual, like opening video package like you push the button and it just comes it up. plays that and you know it's just more entertaining for them to watch yeah okay. and for those people who want to get through the first 10 minutes of you and i just blabbering on about nothing having to do with babylon 5 
Okay. Usually it's less than five, but today we went a little long. Um, people can like just skip to that part if they want to, you know, get to yeah. where they, where they are. I'm just saying it might be more fun. And for those of you out there listening on the podcast feed who are like, huh, maybe I should go check out the YouTube channel. You should just go to YouTube and search for Babylon five for the first time. Um, and you know what happens over there? People talk to us at a YouTube lot. A, lot. a lot and we get lots of fun comments over there and we get to talk back, which is super cool. Jeff, this is what we call a, a served up transition in the biz. <laughs> right? That's that's a little segue. We there you go. Name this segment, I think. But yeah, over on YouTube, we have comments and discussions going on. And recently, Henrik Haranen, sorry if I mispronounced that on YouTube, says, I love this. And I think this was in regards to the war prayer episode. Okay. Says, boy, oh boy, do you two bring this episode to life or what? Yes. Even with things we might think a bit differently of or where your speculation is naturally off, your enthusiasm shows and you bring such good points to the table. I am definitely one of those people who watch your YouTube videos from start to finish. Thank you for that. You clearly are already well on the path of becoming two of us, two of us. And I very much think doing this with a friend is much more fun than going alone because together you can ponder and speculate to your heart's content without fear of spoilers. As you've already discovered, speculation is a significant and rewarding part of the Babylon 5 experience, particularly in the early days when you still are no are nothing knowing Jon Snow's. He gave himself that, says, oops, wrong show. He buzzed Good. himself. He did. He buzzed himself <laughs> for the Game of Thrones reference. Thank you, Henrik. That was great. Henrik, I give that comment five deltas. That's so very Star Trek of you of like, hey, you guys are just not knowing anything that you don't know. And that's totally cool because we're all going to be friends. Like, and that's amazing. And Jeff, while I'm enjoying this experience with you. I'm going to expand that into the broader meaning because what's really cool is this community with people like Henrik who are developed, like we're starting to see the same names come back. We're not starting. We've been seeing we've been. the same yeah. names come back and we're like kind of getting to know people in the comments section, which is super cool. And it's like, it's like hanging out with a bunch of friends. I mean, how many comments we're getting hundreds of comments per episode. Yeah. And it's like hanging out with hundreds of friends for the first time. Yeah. It's one of my favorite things when these episodes come out to be like, oh my gosh, who are we talking to this week? And I, and I'm not going to lie. Like, and I think I even texted you with this one, Henry. I'm like, this is exactly what I needed to hear. Like, this is so cool and validates what we're doing. And I think we struggle. I know I struggle and we talked about this before, so I'll just touch on it quick, but there's such a great Babylon five community and it's hard mm -hmm. for us to crack into that because, because we can't have spoilers. And so we can't be a part of it yet. We can't have those discussions for the sake of the show. Yeah. So Henry for saying we're becoming yeah. two of you, uh, means the world. That's awesome. That's awesome. Thanks, Henry. Appreciate it. We have a website, Babylon five first.com. It's the number five the word first.com and Alexander Bohm sent us a message through that. And you can do that too. You just click a little button, gives you a form, ends up sending me an email. But Alexander says, listening to your discussion of the war prayer was so much fun. It's always great when you can hear the excitement about an episode before the discussion even starts in earnest. I'm glad you found a sort of upper benchmark to say, ah, this is the potential Babylon 5 is aiming for. I particularly enjoyed your little leadership tangent on Veer and Londo. Your experience shown through in that discussion, and it's great to see that kind of expertise applied to the show. I happen to run a leadership development podcast. So that was pretty, that's pretty great to hear. That's, that's literally what we do is we take those skills we've developed on those podcasts and put it here. Do it here. Literally what we're doing. Yeah. He goes on to say, plus I'm happy you're finding so much more to like about Veer now. I think the actor did a great job handling the transition from comic relief to an earnest character. Thanks, Alexander. Although in today's episode, he might have gone backwards just as tad. Except for the, the death glares he gave Londo at one point. Not that I don't have any feelings about. Yeah, we'll get to that piece for <laughs> sure. Well, we like to guess what our episodes coming up are going to be about. We just said no spoilers. We don't look ahead to anything. And so we literally 
see the name, the title of the next episode, that's all we have. And so we like to guess what the next episode is based on the name alone. Brett, I'm going to kind of cut this one a little short for us because we thought it was going to be one thing. You and I thought the same thing. And hey, guess what? Pretty much was. It was. Bingo. And you know what that means? That's two in a row for yours truly. Thank you, folks. Wow. Thank you. I got the boxing one. I got Indiana Jones. Here we go. Bar is going up high. That's impressive. But yeah, we're like, hey, this is going to be about the Holy Grail. And Mm -hmm. there we are. Yeah. Well, guys, speaking of the Holy Grail, in today's episode, we are discussing Grail. Or as we come to find out, it is the Holy Grail. Now, for those of that may be watching along with us, and maybe you didn't get to watch this one before you're listening to the show, or you're just watching along with us anyway, and you've never seen Babylon 5 like us, okay, first of all, you should be watching. But if not, Jeff, remind the folks out there what happened in today's episode. As I walked through the valley of the shadow of death, I took a... L- I'm going to do that over again. I killed the react. But- Please tell me you're going to wrap this. As I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I, I took a look at my life and realize there's none left. Please tell me that's what you're getting. All right, we'll do it. We'll do it. Yes. YouTube, this is just for you. Well, actually, no, it's more for me than anybody else. But <laughs> go ahead. For you, Brent. Like, I'm so excited for this. As I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I take a look at my life and realize there's nothing left. Well, that's what a guy named Jinxo is thinking as he realizes He's spending most of his life living in a gangsta's paradise. Well, at least, at least here on Babylon five. Okay. Maybe, maybe not at all. Maybe, maybe I just wanted to throw that in. See, Jinxo is wrapped up with some really bad dudes led by a guy named Deuce. He owes Deuce a whole bunch of cash. Uh, Jeff, Jeff, I'm sorry. His name is said Deuce. Deuce. It's put, put some respect on that name there, Jeff. It's. Deuce. As Brent grew up in Kentucky, knows better than anybody else. I apologize for my accent. Well, do, do, deuce. Can't even do it. I can't even do it. Yeah, don't do that. That's, it's just offensive when just you offensive. Like I can because that's where I'm from. You, that's just don't, don't do that. All right. I'm going to go back to where Jinxo owes <laughs> Deuce <laughs> a whole bunch of cash and he's here to collect. And Jinxo wonders if he's worth that deuce. If you got that, you got it. If you didn't, well, look it up. But Deuce is about to get his due in court. So he's making sure that that doesn't happen by wiping the minds of witnesses against him. And how does he wipe those minds? Oh, he doesn't. Apparently, he's got Ambassador Kosh doing it. Bum, bum, bum. Meanwhile... Gol Madrid, I mean, Aldous Gaich comes on board to, well, I yep. thought it was Chancellor Gorkong. Maybe. Yeah. Or, uh, any of like 16 other, he was on the planet of, uh, eternal Nimbus three as well. Mm-hmm. Yeah. He was also on the planet of the apes, <laughs> but <whatever. laughs> wasn't he? guy's pretty ubiquitous and ama- and absolutely amazing. If he doesn't win an award. In his lifetime, just for what he does in this episode alone, and I have lost faith in every award show ever. But he's here to search for the uh Holy Grail, or the Sacred Vessel of Regeneration, or Cup of the Goddess. The Minbari hold this guy in really high regard, while Sinclair finds his quest laughable. Well, our buddy Jinxo tries to pickpocket him and ends up getting sentenced to hanging out with him while the, with the hanging out with the Grail Hunter as he takes personal responsibility for him. But not before we learn that Jinxo earned his name, Jinx O, by basically destroying the other four Babylon stations. Or not. Maybe it just turns out that he happened to leave each station at a very opportune time just before they either went boom! or just disappeared. Dr. Franklin figures out that the Mind Wiper is a Nakaleen feeder, a creature so terrifying that Londo hands over super secret documents and locks himself, along with Veer, in his quarters. Okay, 
It's not Kosh, apparently. Well, Aldous explains to Jinxo why he hunts the Grail and says that's why they call him the Seeker. Okay, that one was a Who reference there. I'm full of these tonight. Well, they start really connecting just about the time that Deuce's thugs come for Jinxo, but they end up kidnapping the Seeker. As Deuce is about to dump him and the Ombuds, Judge, to the feeder, Garibaldi and crew swoop in for the rescue. The feeder gets killed, and sent to Franklin for examination while the Seeker gets caught in the crossfire as he blocks a blast meant for Jinxo. As he dies, Jinxo, or Thomas, as he goes by now, agrees to take on the quest for the Grail. Aldous's last words are, You have chosen wisely. Or not, but it's, it's totally implied that's what he meant. Thomas joins Aldous's body as it's sent off to be buried Delenn makes some really weird and kind of uncomfortable comments to Sinclair about him being a seeker as well. But he, Sinclair, Garibaldi, and Ivanova nervously watch Thomas head into the jump gate, fully expecting the station to blow up. But in the words of Ivanova, no boom today. So Brent, what did you think? Grail. Well, there will eventually be a boom. I mean, tomorrow. Yeah. Somebody's got to have, pers- have some perspective around here. It's going gonna, it's gonna to boom sometime. Um, all right. This episode, uh, first of all, I just would like to reiterate for, uh, you know, sake of, I was right. Two for two. Yep. We're not going to count the other ones. Just a two for two. And um, two. I- I'm terribly mixed on this episode. Okay. This was a season one episode. hundred percent. You know what I mean? It was a season one episode. We talked about war prayer earlier and and one of the commenters had said you know setting a bar high this episode does not come close to what war prayer was it does not that being said uh okay it's not that i didn't not like the episode okay i just don't know that i liked it does that make sense it does i didn't not like it i just don't know that i did like it however this is another one of those episodes. And I feel like there's been a, a handful of these, this season so far, where even though as a whole, I wasn't a huge fan of the episode, there were several elements in this episode that I really, really dug and thought were pretty cool. But as an episode, I was like, yeah, it's do they all, one do episode. they all basically involve Londo? Cause like that's no, a lot of them involve David Warner. Oh yeah. There's that. <laughs> I mean, seriously, like we. We'll talk, probably talk about it a little more, but there's a couple moments in this episode where, I mean, he is acting like his life depends on it. The lighting is bad. Some of the costumes are ridiculous. The script is laughable, but he's like, I am Mm -hmm. this guy. I am the seeker. Everybody around him is acting horribly, Mm -hmm. whether it's Jinxo or Sinclair or what and i i've just decided we had this discussion last week and just just so you guys know i'm off the sinclair train i'm off the michael o'hare train i like i've just i've decided he's a bad actor you're just doing it that's there that's where i am now to be fair there have been plenty of star trek actors that in the early seasons i really did not like <laughs> namely nana visitor Procuring Kira and Reese in the first couple seasons of Deep Space Nine. The latter seasons, she really grew on me. Jonathan Archer, Scott Bakula, I think he's the worst portrayed captain we've ever had in Star Trek until you get to season four. And then he actually turned out to be pretty okay. Um, you know, that we're no stranger to this. Neelix got a lot better. Julian Bashir got a lot better. Uh, yeah, Bashir did. Yeah, I'm not, yeah. I'm not gonna say uh, Neelix. Daniel Jackson in Star uh, Stargate, he got much better as the show went on. Uh, General Hammond got much like lots of. We've seen lots of this happen. Although I think those actors were portrayed very, very well. Just the character got better. I'm hoping that happens with Sinclair. I'm just hoping it doesn't take till season five, yeah, for him to get better at acting in this role. That's all I'm gonna say there. That being said, uh. Yeah, there's an episode that was full of a lot of things, uh, full of a lot of things. I like, let me try that again. Please mark that. 
this was an episode where I liked a lot of the elements to it, even if I didn't like the episode as a whole. Um, but David Warner, oh my gosh, you, you mentioned there's a spot where he's just acting his butt off. The man gave a master class in how to die on screen. Oh my gosh. Yeah. Oh my word. The man is acting against a, a adult film prop reject. And he is holding his, I mean, it, it like, it's this, this big phallic thing hanging out in there and he's staring it down. Like you shall not pass. Like you come forth from here. Like, and it was, and I bought every single second of it, you know? And then when he goes, to, when he goes to beat up those thugs, you know what I mean? Yeah. And I'm like, dude, this guy is Yoda. I mean, so, he's bam, 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 dude, You know bam. who this guy is like, and. And, and I'm feeling this because I just, we, we talked a week ago, I finished watching Obi-Wan. This guy is the prototype Qui-Gon Jinn. Yeah. The way he carries himself, the way he's like, well, I guess I'm, I'm, I'm going to have to be, and boom, just busts it out. Like, yeah. Everything about him. Yeah. And I, I fully expected when he got in that fight, he was going to do some sort of like mortal combat sub-zero, like, whoa, right. some energy thing was going to come out and it was be all sci-fi. No, no. He just beat the hell out of him with a stick. And did it well. I mean, Donatello could have learned some moves from this dude. You know what I'm saying? So I really like David Warner. Uh, there's a couple of other pieces in this we can talk about. I have, I think I may be leaving this episode with more questions than I came into it though. Yeah. Um, but overall that's, that's kind of my vibe. How about you? Yeah. I mean, I was just like, eh, eh. I, I like the Londo stuff a lot. Oh, it was so funny. Yeah. yeah. My, my complaint with it though, is that it, it was, it's not that it was funny, but they like, they changed the soundtrack around to be like, this is funny. Ha ha ha. Oh yeah. There was enough between him and Veer that like totally made it work. And it yeah. was their, their back and forth was excellent. Him and the casino was awesome, but they kept having just like this, I don't know, like almost like nineties must watch TV sitcom, like. Uh, da, 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 kind of music thing and i don't know it's pretty awful Did they insert a laugh track I, I was almost like, like it was that close that close right. this to me a lot of this story just didn't hold up like i don't understand yeah. where a lot of stuff came from like okay so deuce is some extortion guy and has a racket going on he's trying to get rid of witnesses okay i get that why doesn't he just kill him and dump the bodies why does he got this mind sucker thing why is he making them think it's caught? I mean, they kind of explained that, like, we want, I want them to think the Vorlon's working He's, for me. He was, he was in an Egger suit. It was an <laughs> Egger suit. <laughs> but yeah, I just, I don't know. It, it didn't make a lot of sense. And uh -huh. the grail, like the whole thing with the grail, I've said this a couple of times now, and I know people yeah. are going to have, have thoughts when I say this, but if this grail thing doesn't pay off in some way, I'm going to be really disappointed. Like, like I, okay. So let's talk about what the grail was. So he's seeking his whole life for the grail, right? Which, mm -hmm. you know, heals people and, and preserves life and whatever. And I don't know if they ever actually found a grail or, or led to it, or he, you know, Thomas is going to go off and try to find it, but I kind of got the impression that in dude's dying breath, yep. right? Mm -hmm. That he realized that he was the grail himself. Okay. That, that he, like, he's going to live on the, you know, this spirit of the seeker is going to continue on now in Thomas. He, he, he realized like, oh, this is what's going forward. So the, it's been renewed, even if it's not me. I mean, he's doing a whole dread pirate Roberts thing with this kid, right? Yeah. Like, yeah. You know, he's passing on the mantle and. And he has healed Jinxo mm -hmm. from this affliction. And I really, 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 Jeff, at the right point, I want to get your leadership opinion on how the, the, that all this yeah, treated the men the uh, Jinxo. I mean, yeah. it was phenomenal. Yep. The way Everything he handled this that. guy. Um, but I, like the, I don't know if I was reading into that, if I just thought it and because like, that's kind of where I was expecting it to go. Like, yeah, it may not be an actual cup that he was searching for his whole life, 
but he found it in the very in the very last moment and now thomas gets to go off and have that same journey and it and it's been renewed the search well, has been renewed and i think that makes sense too because he talks about how he was on mars and he'd lost his family and he mm -hmm. was just a broken man grieving yeah. until some person came along who shared his quest with him and effectively healed him yeah as well so healed him he became the seeker went on mm -hmm. he healed thomas who's gonna go on it makes me yeah. wonder though because like he totally has some jedi mind powers in this whole thing like it starts up where he goes up to the ombuds and he's like oh you know in my temporary lap lapse of judgment like the ombud says that and then changes right. the plea deal he totally just like hey, can we just call, i'm sorry i'm sorry can we just call him judge? Yeah, because actually, ombuds is such a weird word. So ombuds like, is a, it's a great, I, I work with ombuds. We used to use the word ombudsman a lot. Now it's ombuds or ombuds person. Like that's a word I'm super familiar with. I use it really? all the time. Yeah. In I've fact, never heard of this word before in my life. Oh my gosh. So I have a coffee cup over in my other office. I thought it was here that I got because I present to our state's long-term care ombuds on a regular basis and help them. But on, uh, ombuds is essentially an advocate. So I like to, I'll use the long-term care ombuds as an example, cause I know it well. So long-term care, like nursing facilities, assisted living facilities, things like that. Huh. Um, ombuds people go into these facilities and they're there for the residents. And so if the resident right. has a complaint, Hey, my food is gross. Uh, this guy hits me at night. It's uh -huh. too cold. This is a person they can complain to. And then they go advocate them to the regulating body or whatever it is. Ombuds sometimes act as an arbiter sometimes, yeah. but generally they're an advocate for a thing. So if there's yeah. a justice system where they go see the ombuds and then they escalate to a judge or something that would make sense to me, but the use of the term ombuds person did not, didn't work for me. So maybe the judge. script writer didn't know, didn't or know were, the difference. Or That's I, a, I just never knew that. Okay. I've just been educated. Yeah. I, had I think no they were trying to be aspirational, right? In a way of like, well, we don't judge people. Oh, yeah, there you go. I did know though, that they, he's got the earth Alliance badge on him. So it is an earth justice system yeah, yeah, yeah. that they're using. All right. But yeah, so, I, I, so he heals those people. He's kind of the grail, but he has those special powers. And so what I wondered is, is there a tie somehow in this to soul hunter where yeah. it's not just a dread pirate, pirate Roberts thing where it's the mantle. There's an actual transference of a soul essentially that happens. And, but with, does he really have powers though, Jeff, I, I, or is he just like, he's so confident in who he is that it, it pushes out. I mean, cause he had that feeder yeah, like under control totally until yeah. somebody like shot him in the arm and then he died. Like, yeah, that's he, where I think it's gotta be. It's gotta be a power of some kind. It can't yeah. like, I, I mean, maybe, I don't know, but. Just this, this, this mind sucker seemed to be pretty focused on just eating brains. Like that's all it wanted to do. And for mm -hmm. him to just be like, no, it's not the darkness. There is light show thyself. And then he yeah. just does like, yeah, those are, those are Jedi mind tricks. Totally. <laughs> <laughs> uh, just, and this is the last word I want to have about the, the, the monster. He's called a feeder. This is about as glorious of a name that they could come up with. Like remember in soul hunter, the pain giver, right? It's a pain giver. This is a feeder. I gotta give a little credit there. It's a Nakhalin feeder. So there's some Nakhalin thing, and this is the feeder species or race. I guess of the it's, I don't know. it's a, it's a tripod and <laughs> <laughs> listen, folks. I just want to refer you back to my, uh, my, my preview watching video. You need to go, uh, check that out. Um, it might be a little NSFW if you know what I'm saying. <laughs> it's PG, the, but it's a little NSFW. Maybe not really, but shades of it's a, yeah. shades it, of. Yeah. 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 The, the, the feeder. It's I, one of those. It should be one of those that like goes over the heads of the younger listeners out yeah. there and they'll catch it a few years later, but mom and dad enjoy it for now. We've been playing pretty loose with those references here lately. We should probably keep that in check still that yeah yeah we're trying to it's a family friendly show jeff exactly it's a family exactly. friendly show but i think with the feeder i i i want to say because we've been pretty critical of the effects on this show and given yeah. its time and place i was impressed with the design of the feeder like yeah. i definitely saw these oh gosh have i already used have i used one or two so far okay good 
I really saw the seeds of eight, four, seven, two. Yeah. Like this, like this was kind of that, like we, I, I think that the, the production company that did species 8472 on Voyager saw this and was like, oh yeah, yeah, we can work on that and tweak this. And mm -hmm. I was really impressed with it. That, I mean, there were parts of this where the feeder was completely CGI at yeah. some point, um, or it was CGI overlaid. And like, it was really obvious because it went from, uh, physical prop to CGI back to a physical prop. Like, and you could see the hard cuts of where they, yeah. they made that and put that in. I think you're absolutely right though. Like this is one of those, you go, okay, given what they had to work with at the time, they did, they did really good here. Yeah. 30 years later, it doesn't really hold up. No. You know, like it looks, it looks every bit of like what we would watch TOS, you know, back in the day, like it just, the. The walls shake when they walk through a door, like it just, <laughs> yeah. just what it is like, uh, one question like, I have yeah. on that feeder though, uh -huh. is, so I think, I think they called it quasi sentient when they kind of figured out when Dr. Franklin figured out what it was, mm -hmm. there's a weird scene where in the encounter suit, it starts talking and it's like mm -hmm. more food, more food, richer food. And so it speaks English, apparently. Mm -hmm. I kind of wonder, and, and I'm not going to fault Garibaldi or anybody for this. They didn't know at this point, but are they more sentient than we thought? And like, this might Probably. be more of a, yeah, like, I, I don't know. I, yeah. I think that I felt the second time I watched this episode, I felt really uncomfortable when they just blasted it into oblivion. Cause I'm like, I, I feel like it was trying to commute. If this were a Star Trek episode. Mm -hmm. I don't think this is a reference. I'm just going to, if this, if this were a Star Trek episode, tell me if this needs to be a reference, but I think that when it tried to communicate, that would be a moment to stop and somebody would start asking, even in there where it was just a criminal, somebody would be like, wait, did it, does it think other things? Does it have thoughts? Does it have feelings? Someone yeah. would have asked the question here. They're just like, yeah, we'll get you some better food. Don't worry. And then they blasted it into oblivion. Jeff. That's totally a Star Trek reference, buddy. You're done. So I'll done. Run. That's the fastest I've ever gone through. <laughs> <laughs> How many do I have left? I got two left, right? I think you got two left. Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah, you're right. That's exactly what would have happened. Captain, Captain Picard or somebody would have been like, oh, wait a minute. He's or Wesley or somebody yeah. that thing's more sentient than we, th and that would have been the thing is recognizing and respecting life all life, even yeah. when it's trying to eat you, um, that would have been, that would have been the Star Trek thing. And that's not what they were going for here. No, I'm going to shift this to a little bit of a lighter note, if you don't mind. Yeah. So remember a couple episodes ago when the dock workers were really overwhelmed and Ivanova was really overwhelmed and they went on strike, even though they weren't really allowed to go on strike and there was a big fight and, you know, dude comes in and he's like, I'll get you my pretty at the end. Like, you remember that? Oh yeah. Oh yeah. Oh. Apparently everything's cool on the docks right now. Yeah. Things are running super smooth. Yeah. I guess, I guess they used that 1.5 million credits to get those upgrades in real fast and hire some more people because they were like, Hey ship, come on in. Just welcome in park right over there. We'll come get you. You need anything? Can I get you a bottle of water or maybe a fill up and some gas? What, what, what can I do for you? Like, yeah, super. Well, honestly, between this one and then last week, like, right. The last call to board, right? And rabbis in line, 10 minutes, mm -hmm. get on here, yeah, run like clockwork. Yeah. Yeah. Fantastic. Yeah. Docs just aren't, aren't that overwhelmed anymore. Um, we got a good dose of Lanier in this one. I don't know the last time it was, we actually got to see him. This might be the most we've ever really heard him talk. I think it was. And be, and be front and center. Um, all right. So I have a prediction. Okay. And this is more just. It, trying to be as unspoiled as you can 30 years later, the guy who plays Lanier is Bill mummy. Mm -hmm. Bill mummy's a pretty big name. Yeah. Even back in the nineties was kind of a big name, right? I cannot believe that he's in to play a little side character who doesn't actually do anything. So a little and, and, fan, like, I'm sorry. But yeah. I mean, oh my gosh. Yeah. And he, um, like 
when you when I've seen things talking about Babylon Five, Bill Mummy is almost always the first one that I see mentioned. Yeah. Oh yeah, Bill Mummy was in that, and then usually it's Londo and and uh, uh, Jakar, those two actors. Like it, it those it's, those are the three names hmm. that come up as like these were the guys in Babylon Five. So he has to he has to get a much bigger part. I'm assuming as the as the show goes on, uh, and I don't know what that means going to happen with the Lynn. If anything's going to happen with the Lynn, but he. I'm ready to see more of him. Like I, I want to see this guy become who he's supposed to be. Well, I think we've seen like Natoth really. And I want to see more Natoth too. Yeah. 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 We've seen in a couple episodes of Veer step up and do stuff. Mm -hmm. So yeah, linear, it makes sense, but I'm going to, I'm going to be honest. I, I don't like him at all. I think he's a sequel fan. I think he's, I mean, this sounds, I mean, oh my gosh, as I'm going to say this, it's just like the most horrible thing to say, but like, I don't. I just, I just wanted to punch him in the face. Like, he's just like that. Why? I, well, I, I don't know what it is. What made you feel to me? Maybe there's some inner bully in me or something that's just horrible. But it, it happened like when, um, when Aldous comes on board and, uh, you know, and you must be Lanier. And he's like, I am. And I'm very pleased. <laughs> Shut up. Who's, <laughs> who says that? Like, and then when they're sitting down, he's like, I was so honored to do all this research for you. And we looked everywhere. I found nothing at all. And look at the bib. That's part of my outfit that I'm look at, look how horrible I'd be. I just, I don't know. I, I found everything about his affectation, about, uh, what he was wearing, what he was saying, everything about, it. I'm just like, I don't like this guy. I you know enjoy the, Veer. I yeah. love Natoth. If I never see Lanier again, I'm going to be fine. You know what though? What's really good about what you're saying is he's making you feel something about him. Yeah, that's fair. That's fair. Even if, even if it's detestation you're he's making you feel something about him which it's is pretty what, strongly pretty strong right <laughs> right um okay can we talk about the mimbari because there's definitely some stuff that happened with the mimbari yeah. we talked about more questions than we than we had answers in this episode so they're obsessed with seekers all right now here's what i didn't know i didn't know if they were specifically obsessed with this guy who was coming to the station because there was something mythic, mythical or legendary about the man Aldous, or is it just the fact that this is a man who's coming, who is a quote unquote, true seeker. And it doesn't even really matter if what he's seeking is real or not. Like that doesn't matter. It's just a fact. He's a seeker yeah. and the Mimbari are all about seekers. And we found out about the, or we got reminded, I guess, of the warrior class. And then there's the religious cast and. I want to talk about that in just a second as well, yeah. but you know, obviously Delin and, and Lanier are part of the, uh, uh, religious cast. Like, yeah, it's, that's gotta be well, the ruling cast, right? I'm going to guess. So, I mean, again, yeah. with Delin, I don't know for sure. I think it's you gotta know? be religious cast. I really do. Uh, and I don't know, maybe I'm completely wrong. The folks in the comments down there know, yeah. and they're laughing at me right now or don't tell saying. Brent, you're absolutely right. Yeah. Don't tell me. We'll figure I it out. I think, I think they were most excited that he was a true seeker when, uh, when Garibaldi and Sinclair mm -hmm. were in Zocalo eating and Delenn was like, I can't believe that you're here and not waiting to go meet this guy. You don't even know is coming. Mm -hmm. She made a comment about, um, we had no idea that your race had such a wonderful, mysterious person as part of it, or something along those yeah. lines. Like she was shocked. So I think it was just. Like here's a true seeker. And then when he comes off board, Lanier's like, oh, that that's the guy. Oh, you know him? No, but he has the look. The look. Yeah. So there's something about Mimbari as a whole, something about their cast, something about their culture that is tuned into something like this, which leaves me with the question, what is going on with these people? Yeah. Like, I don't know what it is, but it definitely has made me sit back and go, they, they do this weird seeker spiritual thing. Like, again, I go back to soul hunter where, you know, it was Delenn who was like, give me back the souls. You have stolen the Mimbari soul so that we can, we can now all be one where we can't be one without these missing souls. And, you know, like, like she took it personally that there was some stuff going on there. And yeah, this seemed to play into that. So I don't know what's going on. And then, you know, how does this go to the whole Mimbari thing and what they did with Sinclair and the hole in his mind. And I was really like, uncomfortable with all that because she, um, she's talking to Sinclair and making the case that he is also a true seeker. 
Right. But what I think really bothered me is what I, and maybe this is me just reading into it, but basically she's like, Hey, you have a hole in your mind that we put there and you're seeking it. So, yeah. Hey, you're a true seeker too, huh, buddy? Huh? Yeah. Like it really, it almost hit me like an abusive relationship thing where it's like, oh yeah, yeah. you've got that bruise on your face. Yeah, you do. Don't you? I, I think I remember the part you're talking about. And I remember looking at that going like. She gave him a pretty hard look when she was talking to him about that. Oh yeah. And I was like, she knows something. I mean, obviously, yeah. obviously she knows something is up with Sinclair and something about him and, and she knows what's going on, but like, it's like, she knows that he knows now, or she's teasing him with it or something. Well, like she's something. trying to feel it out. She's like, you're yeah. seeking something, right? Huh? Huh? Yeah. Like and he plays it off great. He's just like, right. yeah, I'm talking about all this. I don't know what you're talking about. Like, mm -hmm. so the, the difference of classes this is the last piece I have on the Minbari. Um, the difference in classes or mm -hmm. casts, the that, cast. I should say yeah. they only have two casts, the warrior class, the religious cast. And apparently it's a really, really, really bad thing when they agree on anything. I got the impression that the last time they agreed led to the earth Minbari war. Like that's why that war happened as they agreed. Yeah. She talked about the atrocities, the recent atrocities. And I feel like 11 years isn't really recent, but I can't think of any other atrocities that came from the, the Minbari. Yeah. I don't know. I mean, so like, is the idea that just the war, everything the warrior cast does is wrong. And so if we have any agreement, we're agreeing with something wrong. Like, is that the sentiment there? Like. Why is it, if they agree on anything, it's bad. And let's hope it never happens again in our lifetime. I think it's, if they agree, they're an unstoppable force essentially. And then, and then, and then the Len at least has the wisdom to see that yeah. where I think more, it, it, it may almost just be more political. Like she talked about, they were yeah. talking about the grail thing and how they've asked all of their, you know, colleagues and colonies and stuff around the galaxy to help the warrior cast doesn't know about this and they don't need to. So we're just not even going to mention it to them. Like they don't even need to know about it. So Jeff, if I could, uh, allow my, my patriotism to flourish here just for a moment. <laughs> all right. All right. Let's see it. This actually very much reminds me of America and we have a two cast system effectively or a two party system. Okay. You know, between Republicans and Democrats. And we almost never agree on anything on the surface, yeah. on the surface. And I'm not going to say that it would ever be bad to not agree. Cause I think that's actually a really good thing. But that idea that can you imagine what would happen if our people could actually agree, could actually like, like, okay, here's your star Trek message, right? Like if we can put aside those differences and actually work together and actually come together in a unified front, think about the last time that America really unified around something. Right. And you want, you know, the only thing that comes to my mind is recently was right after September 11th and the tragedies that happened there, the entire country was united around, let's go get those dudes. Yeah. Mm -hmm. We like, everybody was like, yes. And you know what happened? We're still, we're still we, picking up the pieces. We, we toppled two countries in like 30 days. Like it was, it was crazy. I'm not, I'm not commenting if it was right or wrong. I'm just saying that that's what happened. Well, I mean, like, you can go back to world war two where we were united and literally the yeah. world was at war and we were like, oh no, you're not, not anymore. <laughs> done. We're in it. Yeah. Yeah. You done. you put us together and, and now you done screwed up. Yeah. And frankly, know. that's oversimplification. I don't want to under, you know, underplay what it was, but I mean, hundred percent some level. Oh, America's involved. Oh, okay. Well, we're good now. <laughs> Oh, and they're united. Yeah. yeah. They're, oh, they're not fighting with each other right now, uh, because they have a common enemy right now. Like, like, again, this is, this is me letting my patriotism fly here, you know? Um, and yeah, um, I, gosh, what happens if we actually freaking just can agree? It's almost like that together. meme. We're unstoppable. Exactly. It's that meme of like some, like perfectly pristine, clean, super futuristic place. And it's like, you know, what happened if, you know, this thing never happened, but oh, we, we would have this, you know, it's like, yeah, mm -hmm. totally. we, we would be, it would be utopia. Yeah. I don't know if they were trying to make that as a comment on America or anyone else or humanity as a whole. Imagine what happens if humanity could unite. Right. Yeah. You know what I mean? How unstoppable would we be? 
if humanity could unite. Well, and honestly, there's your Star Trek mess. Well, and I was, and, and you've been teetering on here right there a little bit. I'm going to, <laughs> you got one more, but watch me work around it. That's what happens in mass effect. So in mm. mass effect, all I'm going to give you a three mass effect. I know <laughs> you almost should mass effect Dune. like, give me the, but the, uh, all the different races are doing their stuff and whatever. When mm -hmm. humanity comes on, that's the thing that pushes them forward. In fact, if humanity yeah. hadn't come together and joined the galactic thing, the Reapers would have come in and wiped everybody out. So yeah, yeah, we're I'm, all pointed at the same thing. I mean, in the same in the same vein, I'm in my other podcast, Beat Me Up, a Star Trek podcast. My co-host and I, he is going through the show Enterprise for the very first time. And what we have discovered, and I've never really thought about it before in this in this path, but basically the universe could not come together until humanity came on the scene and it was the, it like, it's like, it's weird and it's self aggrandizement, but it is what it is. It's like humanity is the hope of the galaxy. It takes humanity to unite the people and bring them together, you know, because the Vulcans and the Andorians and the Teller, it's like, they were all separate and warring against each other. And it took humanity to say, stop it. We're, I'm friends with all three of you. We're going to come together. We're going to put that aside. We're going to make this work. It took humanity to do that. Yeah. You know, um, humanity it makes could sense. be unstoppable. It makes sense. Cause humanity is the one writing the show. <laughs> right. If Centauri were writing it, would, but, right. but, but the, you know, the whole point is that we explore ourselves through it. And I think that's why, right. why humanity is the piece. Speaking of humanity mm -hmm. kind of being the tying force through everything again, to lighten the tone a little bit. How about that scene in the open in front of the judge? when dude was Sue an alien for his great grandfather, ducting his great grandfather. I, I, I said, there, I was like, wait, is he talking about like the fifties Roswell, New Mexico dudes? Like, okay, that's, that's good. Super duper funny. I love Jeff. I love it. When sci-fi takes earth history and rewrites it into being something new, like, like they, they give you a spin on what it really was. And here you like to talk about the Holy grail. Well, yeah, it was this, it was this, or the cup of the goddess or whatever. It goes by many names, but this is what it is. Are there, and even in this one of like, that, that one even wasn't rewriting. It was just a, nope, this is true. And this uh -huh. is what happened. And there they are. <laughs> like that was so, by the way, that's why I really, really love Stargate because Stargate yeah. does that repletely <laughs> all the way through the show. Anyway, uh. Wow. We have spent like the last 20 minutes talking about something that this episode wasn't even really about. I know it was a line that sent us somewhere else. All right. I have a question. Okay. A technical question. How long is a cycle and how long yeah. is 300 of them? And they kept dropping that. Cause at first I was like days. Yeah. No way. Is it, is it hours? Who gives 300 hours? Who does right. that? Like, yeah, right. it didn't make any sense to me. But then later, like, Hey, you got a few minutes. You gotta be up there in 10 minutes. Okay. Well, yeah. we're using that time nomenclature. So what is it? And my guess was that a cycle is how long it takes for the station to rotate because it rotates for, but that's just in my brain. I got the only, but um, how long is that? I have they, no idea. Right. Three, that actually makes sense is what that could be. But like, is some, who's counting 300? How do yeah, I know that it's 300? Like, do I have it, a watch that's rotating with the thing? It's spinning so that I feel inertially in one place. So it's not like I can be like, Oh, there's one. Oh, there's two. <laughs> you got a little thing that you're ticking by every time. Yeah. It by. <laughs> yeah, made no sense. It was actually on the second time I watched it, it became really distracting when they're like, you have 300 cycles, you have 240 cycles. I'm like eight minutes. I, what, what, what is happening? Yep. Um, oh, oh, you know me and signage. I love signage. This wasn't a sign, but it was a graphic on the TV and I've never noticed it before. Babcom. Yes. Babcom. They're just That's like, the name um, of their communication system is Babcom. We're on Babylon five. Well, what should we call the communication system? What about BT and T, right? Like the <laughs> Babylon telephone and telegraph. No, no, that's not going to work. I don't know. I mean, it's just a Bab. Babcom, you, sir, why yeah. don't you go and, uh, let's, let's find the guy who wrote the, uh, wrote the jingle for Menon <laughs> by Menon. Menon. Hey, we need you to, uh, Babcom. Nice job. I'm total Jim Gaffigan. 
bit there. It's yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. Oh my gosh. Um, Oh, okay. Talk about the Centauri. Oh, you were going to talk about, no, that? no, oh. actually I was getting ready to go to the Centauri, but let me transition to it for it. Oh, yeah, so yeah. We can actually talk about Centauri. So they say something in this episode that has me going. So what happens on the shit on the station? Now they said that thing is from Londo's jurisdiction. Mm -hmm. So like, are the ambassadors in charge of various sections of the station? Oh, I read that totally. Or like what, like, or he came from a Centauri world. So yeah. now he's uh, like, I, I was, I was so confused about, oh, we're in Wando's jurisdiction now. And we are going to bypass Jakar's jurisdiction. Like what? Yeah. I totally read that as this came from Centauri space and. Sinclair basically was like, oh, Londo. Yeah. This is Londo's jurisdiction. That's his area. Let's go ask him about it. I, and, yeah. I don't know. It made sense to me. I, that, that actually makes more sense than Londo's in charge of a section of the station. Yeah. But it like the way they went into it, I was like, it just made me think maybe it was actually a physical part of the station where he was in charge of. And I was like, that's new. Yeah. That would, not I hope that's that. not it. Yeah. Yeah. I'm pretty sure it's just okay. that these knuckling came and, and I think that's what we kind of saw where, oh my gosh, like I hate, again, I hate that they made this into comedy, but the minute he knew that this feeder thing was legit, he's like, nope, I'm out of here. I'm here. You want, you want top secret stuff? Great. Here you go. I'm in here. Mm -hmm. Like that was legit. Yeah. And the one thing, mm, like if I could go back and change, there were a lot. Of, so he's in the casino. That's mm -hmm. where, where they, uh, was it? Yeah. Sinclair went to go catch him in the casino. So he loses, he doesn't get his 17. He's drinking a little bit as he's mm -hmm. talking to Sinclair, he reaches across, grabs somebody else's drink, dumps it into his, <laughs> is that what he did? That's funny. I I'm just like, that. oh, that's, that's good. funny. When, when he's like, realizes Sinclair is serious. He sets his drink down. He's like, you need to do this. You need to shut it down. And then he, I wish he would have grabbed his drink as he ran out. Like I thought that would have been a great, touch. that's funny. Yeah. That's really funny. But then it all wraps up at the end. <laughs> When he and Veer and Garibaldi outside and Garibaldi does the thing that I do to like my five and six year old nieces and nephews where I'm like, yeah, everything's fine. But if the ghost comes up the stairs, then you should, what ghost? Oh, no ghost. There's no ghost except a ghost that no one else can see. And don't tell your mom right. that I told you. Right. I, <laughs> Garibaldi pulls it. I told you, I said, Garibaldi's so screwed with these guys right now. The one thing I missed was as Garibaldi walked past them and then walked off screen. He never smi Usually you get like the little smirk of like, yeah, yeah I got him to tell the audience. Like, yes, he was just screwed with it. He never did that. And I was like, and he, this is why I, I, I'm going to look at dress, I like did. how you get yeah, dressed yeah. is why when you get dressed and you want to be cool and fancy, you have one poppy accessory. Like you don't have a real poppy watch and then cool socks. It's too much. You got to have one. In this case, the punchline was Londo sneaking behind Veer to get in and lock the door. If they had Garibaldi doing the smirk on his way out, that's two accessories. So they followed the one accessory rule and I respect that. Fair enough. <laughs> Fair enough. All right. Um, did you have anything else about the Centauri? Just that I loved how Veer was so eager to help and be efficient. Yeah. Or the seeker and Londo's like, dude, what are you doing? We right. need to tell them this is going to take years and money. Like it was just this really scathing commentary on bureaucracy. Mm -hmm. and he even said, he's like, one of these days you or these other young people are going to efficient the Centauri Republic out of existence. It's like, I work with those people. I know them. Right. We're like, we can't, you can't do it that fast. That was really good. I didn't get that whole conversation. No, no, I didn't that, get it at all. The, that spoke right to me. Like when Londo was like. Stop it. Stop. Like I, I knew he was like, oh, he's getting into it. But I was like, why, why does Londo care? He cares because one, if people start to believe that your government or organization can deliver things quickly, they're going to start expecting that on a regular basis. Mm. Two, he saw an opportunity to profit because he was paving the road of like, well, I'm going to talk to a lot of people. This is going to take a lot of time. You know, if you were to give me this much money, yeah. I could probably speed that up where Veer's like, oh, I'm already, I'm already done. Here it is. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it was to me, it was just like this moment that they had funny, playful music about 
but it's just like, wow, this is some of the most scathing commentary on government that this show has had so far. All right. So I'm going to throw this over to the leadership side and I want your comments on this. Okay. I want you to compare Londo's treatment of Veer, particularly in front of guests versus Aldous's treatment of Thomas. Well, what Londo did was inexcusable, hundred percent inexcusable. The right thing to do would have been to let Veer do his thing. Now, let me back up one step. If he was handing over like that super sensitive information they gave to earth, yeah, Londo needs to intervene and be like, no, no, you can't give that to him. Well, he did is inexcusable. You never jump down somebody's throat like that in front of people ever. If Veer is not strong and confident, that will destroy him, destroy him. He'll never, he'll never do anything again. But Aldous and Thomas, let's just call him Thomas. I, oh my God, this guy's incredible. So the, the, it's a form of mentorship and mentorship is really someone with more experience than you that asks you questions and presents things in a different light and generally just makes you think about things differently. Contrast that with a coach who actually helps you do things differently, really oversimplifying these things. But it all starts when Jinxo or Thomas is talking about how he blew up the stations and he's a jinx and he's like, all this is like, you're thinking about this wrong. You're actually a very lucky person. You happened to escape, you know, at the perfect time and all these, oh, I've never thought about it yet. No one, no one does. And there's all, there's a number of these little behind the scenes or momentary things that happen between the two where all this is never trying to be the hero in any way. He's just like, Hey, th look at this thing this way. Oh, think about this thing this way. And then Thomas can either take that as he did and then mm -hmm. literally change his life. Or he can brush it off. It's up to him to do, but, oh, all this is a, did an incredible job mentoring him. And I think, I forget what episode it was, but it was when, uh, Veer stood up to Londo. Yeah. And we talked about, you know, oh, there's gotta be behind the scenes stuff. In fact, I think it's from the comment that I referenced to the top of the episode, but where, you know, Londo must've really mentored this guy and really helped him out and stuff. Well, if he did, every second of that time was just wasted by him jumping down his throat in front of, uh, in front of the seeker and Jinxo there. So two, two thoughts on that mm -hmm. real quick. One, the Veer thing, Veer reverted in this episode. Yeah. You know, like he took some steps forward back during, was it war prayer? I think it was war prayer. Yeah. Um, he took some steps forward and specifically standing up to Londo, like, like his hair grew a little taller that day. Yeah. Well, he got a haircut in this episode. Like he yeah. really went back to the comic, the comic relief. The only thing that ties those two pieces together is after Londo just dresses him down, particularly in front of the other dude, when Londo walks away, Veer like kind of goes from this sort of goofy cowering guy. Like he straightens up a little bit taller yeah. and he's shooting darts with his eyes to Londo. And I'm like, okay, something seems like it's happening there with Veer. And I, I, I need to know what it is. I need to know that Veer is not going to be the guy who gets locked out of the room every day. And this is going to become a running gag. Right. You know what I mean? Like I exactly like, he's not just the, the, yeah. the pudgy sidekick. Like it's I need Veer to be a guy. Before the war prayer, like I, I called him the butt of the joke, you know? Yeah. Veer's the, the, the punchline to everything. Mm -hmm. And that was the first time it's like, oh, oh yeah, there's something here. Yeah. He did. He stood up a little bit, but he was, he was the butt of, of every joke. And, and they made it so apparent that everything the Centauri did in this episode was a joke. And I thought that was really disappointing. But with as heavy as it was, they did need a little bit of comic relief and that's what they went with right, yeah. wrong or indifferent. That's where they are. You mentioned all this and Thomas and that whole relationship. I got to tell you, uh, you earlier referenced him like Qui-Gon Jinn, mm -hmm. the whole Jedi master versus the Padawan type of situation. We've said before in the show that, that I have some formal training in religious studies and stuff. This very much reminded me of the type of a relationship that you would see with like a prophet and his, his men, like the guy who's going to take literally take on the mantle and you know, specifically, I was thinking of Elijah and Elijah. Elisha. Yeah. You know what I mean? Like I was thinking of those two specifically, like it, it had those sort of vibes. 
I'll take Jed, Jedi and Padawan as well because it's kind of the same thing, yeah. <laughs> honestly. Like the the model is there, um, but I got to tell you, I said last week I want a rabbi because I loved what Rabbi Kosloff did. Yeah, you know yeah. what I mean. Like you need a Kosloff. Thank you. You need people like that in your life. I need David Warner in my right. life. Like I need, like this is, this is a dude who builds you up. I want him in my life. You know what I mean? Yeah. Um, and my gosh, he's, well, when, so, you, when you think about he, Thomas, he was lost. He owed hundred thousand credits. He had no hope of anything. He was happy to clean methane toilets all the way to him, putting on the, the, the scarf, the stole yeah. carrying the staff and saying, I'm going to, I will find the grail. Yeah. What a, what a transformation. And he, and he looked like my son wearing my suit. <laughs> the thing was too big for him, but you're like, he's going to grow into it. Well, he, he was doing, and he was, he was doing that, like puffing his chest out yeah. a little bit. He walks by Delenn. He stops. He looks her right in the eye as an equal, you know, yeah. and moves. Oh my gosh. It was great. So good. It's yeah. so good. It was so good. Um, it's, it's really good. So, uh, Thomas leaves the station. And it didn't go boom. Yeah. So this is really, I think the last question that I have here, um, is this raise th this raised it and put it front and center. What did happen with Babylon's with Babylon and then Babylon two, three, and four. Yeah. Because remember he said they didn't name them back. Then. Right. Yeah. Right. That the first one anyway, it was actually upsetting almost uh, in a way that they even brought that storyline up and then did uh -huh. nothing with it. You know, I mean, yeah. I get it in the story arc. You, hey, reintroduce this concept. Okay, cool. That was good. And they did it. This one was sabotaged. This one just blew up. This one wrinkled and disappeared. Great. Mm -hmm. Super good reminder of everything. But I want to know. Like, I don't want curses and rumors and whatever. And that, that doesn't move the needle forward at all. This did. Right. Yeah. I mean, it, it, and in a way, like, it would have been great if he went through that jump gate and something went wrong. Right. Mm -hmm. I mean, not, not that, I mean, I, I would never want to lose the scene with Ivanova cause that was great, but right. also it's just like in that second, they're like, okay, so literally all BS that came before this, it's just, you know, whatever coincidence. Right. Yeah. I, I was bothered by, by that. I would have loved like, as he goes through the jump gate that like somebody walking by dropped a tray of glasses or so, like just yeah. something like, even if especially it was just, when they're all. They're all playing cool. Like, oh yeah, Chris didn't bother me. Yeah, me either. Chris. Oh, God. Right. <laughs> exactly. Exactly. And then Avana's like, something always goes boom around here. Yeah. <laughs> you know. All right. One, Jeff. one quick but, observation that I yeah. had. Um, and then I'll then we can transition into the next piece. But mm -hmm. the shopkeeper who was the be the witness that yeah. first one, the first running career. deer. Yeah, Miriam Running Deer. So there's Miriam Running Deer, Jason Ironheart. Uh huh. I feel like this, I'm wondering, is this like a representation matters? These are some real first nation mm -hmm. indigenous, you know, person's type of type of names. I think it's great, but sure. this is the 23rd century. We're seeing right now the, the homogenization mm -hmm. of first nations people in, in our society now. So what changes right to where like, this is, yeah, just an observation, a question at this point. I think it's cool that they're using the names. Mm -hmm. It's awesome. I just wonder if there's an intent behind it by, uh, J. Michael Straczynski. Yeah. I mean, it, I mean, you hear a name like Straczynski and you don't think anything first nations, at least not with America, but you know, maybe there's some sort of, uh, relation to that or somehow that's on his mind specifically that he's naming his people this, but I had that same thought. Like I was looking at her trying to see if there was any kind of the native American type. Yeah. Uh, you know, did she have a look, a complexion about her? Did she wearing any certain garb or anything like that, that would further that besides just her name. And I didn't, I, they, they yeah, didn't have awesome. a camera on her with lots of light to be able yeah. to see anything really anyway. But, uh, I, I very much appreciate that they're using the names. Yeah. Yeah. It's the same with Ironheart. There wasn't anything clear. It's just, this is, this is yeah. the name. And I think that's pretty cool. Yeah. I had a, I had a, a comedian I used to do a bunch of shows with when I was doing stand up comedy. Uh, his name was Homer Shadowheart, and he he was he was a Native American, and he I mean, and that's his real name. And I was like, dude, that is the coolest ass name yeah. I've ever heard in my life. 
Homer's a good dude. Like Homer, if you're watching, hi. You're awesome. I I miss I miss hanging out with you, man. I really do. He's he's a good dude. Um, but Jeff, I think we've hit that spot where we've got to do the analyzing now. We do. I feel like we've already done a lot of it, frankly. But it's it's time to boil it down and to kind of go. Does this show have that Star Trekky quality? Is there a deep moral message? Are they trying to say something? Hold up a mirror to society? Give us hope for the future? Tell us to stop doing whatever we're doing and slap us upside the back of the head? Something of that nature. So we're going to do that. We're going to grade this on a scale of deltas, zero to five deltas, as far as how Star Trek, I guess we're going to make this episode. I'll throw it to you first, Jeff. How many deltas you give it? Oh, gosh. Well, so let's just say here that, and we'd said this already because th- we also asked if we would watch this again and if we feel yeah. we, we should have watched it sooner. The only thing worth watching this again for is David Warner. And right. frankly, I'll watch him and the other things that, that he's done. I, yeah. I don't need to watch this, this episode again. I think that the themes in this that we talked about in here was the, was really, for me, it was that mm-hmm. mentorship and the power of someone else believing in you and mm-hmm. how that builds up your own self-confidence. That's the thing that comes up in Star Trek. You know, I mean, we, we see that as, and I, and I, and off the top of my head, I can't think of episodes, but like in the original series where Kirk would go and try and help someone on the planet, believe in themselves or believe in, so they would stand up mm-hmm. to the oppressor or whatever. We've seen pieces of that. I, I think it's a great message. I think from a leadership standpoint, <laughs> and I'll tell you, as I was thinking about this, I was like, oh my gosh, this is so Star Trek. This is so, yeah. like, mm, nope. This is so Starfleet Leadership Academy. <laughs> that doesn't mean it's so Star Trek. It is Star Trek though. Um, in that message, I didn't get a, anything else really out of this one that, that rang Star Trek to me. So I'm going to give this one a little bit of credit. Um, I'm going to give it one Delta yeah. or, uh, for at least touching on a really important topic that is foundational yeah. to some Star Trek stuff. How did you rate it? Well, you know, we often say that there's a lot of Star Trek, have, uh, a lot of Star Trek episodes that would not be very Star Trek. Mm-hmm. Okay. Um, and there's a lot of not great episodes of Star Trek. Lots. Yeah. That are very Star Trek. Mm -hmm. This one falls in that kind of a category to me. Like I thought, I thought that this was, this was a pretty Star Trek episode. Okay. Um, because of like, because of that mentorship relationship that Aldous had with Thomas, where he thinks he's a curse. No, you're lucky. He's passing on belief Aldous is valuing people around him he's being who he is he's calling somebody up to be better than they ever were he's giving them a purpose and it's not about acquisition of wealth it's about making humanity better Aldous is like what are you going to do with the the gray the grail what am i going to do with it i'm going to go heal people i'm going to make people better Mm -hmm. i'm not about me i'm about others and i really i really loved that idea the idea of leaders lift. And I don't know if you've heard of this, this concept, I'm sure you probably have leaders lift those that are around them. Mm -hmm. And Aldous came in and did that. He lifted everybody around him and particularly Thomas. We saw that firsthand. So there was a lot of star Trek in this was this fully star Trek. No, but I will give it three deltas. Okay. I'm going to give it three deltas. Cause I thought it actually had quite a bit. Do I want to watch it again? I like the way you put it. I'll watch David Warner and the other stuff. That's a lot more fun to watch, to be frank with you. Would I watch this again? Only if I'm doing a rewatch of the series, I'm never going to sit back and go, Hey, let's watch grail tonight. Right. That's not going to happen, but I'm not going to skip the episode. If I'm doing a rewatch either though, like it's, like I said, I didn't not like the episode. I just didn't like it. Yeah. Yeah. But there's lots about the episode. I did like, I think that's fair. That's it for grail. We did it. Next week, we're going to be watching Eyes for the first time. And now you, dear viewer and listener, know everything that we know about the next episode, the title. That's all we know. And we like to play a game where we guess what we think it's going to be about. So Brent, what do you think Eyes is going to be about? Well, I've I've got a good run going with one word. You do. A lot on the line with one word titles though, I, with TKO and then I had grail and now I got eyes. So I think this is going to be a love story 
slash somebody's up to something kind of okay. a thing. And I think it's going to, because it's going to be somebody's eyes, but somebody's eyes are watching you, but the eyes are going to make somebody fall in love or it's going to put somebody under a spell or something like that. But then it's all going to like be for not because that person's a bad person. We're probably just so you know, the first person you see walking onto the station in the episode, that's going to be it. All right. That's the person who is, who's doing it. But, uh, yeah, that's my guess is that this is a, like a love story. That's not really a love story in the end. Outside of born of the purple with Londo. Well, no, no, never mind. We've had some Catherine. I was going to say, we haven't really had a lot of romances, yeah. but we well, had Malcolm. You had a Bonova. Had, yeah, yeah. Yeah. We've had some stuff, so that's not yeah. fair. Maybe it just doesn't resonate. Okay. I, I'm going to go a whole different direction just for okay. the sake of the game. I think it's going to be about, um, spies, like, uh, some sort of espionage. I've got eyes okay. on this and I don't know what that's going to, who's doing the spying or anything like right. that, but that's, that's where honestly, I'm that's probably closer to the truth. Than what mine is. I don't know, man. Like you've got, you're the master at two for two. So mm. if you can make it three, I don't know what you get, but you get something. Yeah. So, yeah. <laughs> All right. Well, get, get it ready. Cause I'm taking the title, man. Right. I'm yeah. I'll figure title. something out. Well, we're going to find out here next week. Thank you so much for joining us. Don't forget to subscribe wherever you get your podcasts. If you're watching on YouTube, subscribe, like hit the bell, all that good stuff. And if you are listening on the podcast, even if you're watching on YouTube, stop by Apple podcasts, stop by pod chaser, heck stop by audible, leave us a rating and a review. We'll send that out on our Twitter at Babylon first. We'll also read it right here on the podcast. And if you leave us a review, you get a really cool sound drop that I, that I love using. So until next time, Jeff, don't do it. Don't do it. Why? Because you do the same thing every week, man. Why? Dude, honestly, it's kind of making some people uncomfortable. All right. Good. Look, you know what? I'm going to get one of those fear things to slap you in the face. Live long and prosper. It's my first time. All right, we did it. That went so much longer than I thought it was going to go. Yeah, it really did. You know what, though? Always the ones you think that are going to go short are the ones that wind up going long. Seriously, I think we spent 20 minutes talking about a single line that actually wasn't the crux of the show. I know. I know. You know what I mean? We, uh, that's what we do. Right? That's what we do. Five. Yeah. Welcome to Babylon five for the first time folks. Hey, listen guys, thanks for sticking with us. Thanks. What one of our commenters earlier today said, I watch all the way to the end. That was hard. Henrik. No, Henrik. Yeah, there you go. I knew it had an H Henrik. What's up, dude. Thanks for sticking with us and everybody else who's watching all the way to the end. You guys are awesome. Please tell me that I'm going to get a, th that I'm going to go three for three, please. Cause it's a, it's a love story with something else. Or is it a covert spy operation? Or are we so far off? This. Is somebody going to come in and be like, do, do, do this thing. Like I got eyes on you, right? I got eyes on you. <laughs> you That's know. the whole episode. Literally just Garibaldi. And then it flashes to Sinclair <laughs> and Bonneville. Hey, listen, listen, I would be really okay if they recast Sinclair and put David Warner in, just recast him, like let him be. Cause he was so good. I mean, like I, I he can't, was so I can't good. overstate that. Like, and you know, some of the places where I noticed he was the best was when he didn't say anything, he and just, just reacted mm -hmm. and he was just. You know, I was like, oh my gosh, there was a moment when, uh, he and Thomas are walking through the hallway and he's talking to him. He pulls out like his room key card and he turns and then he, he puts it in the thing and then he goes into the door. He turns his back completely towards the car camera and he was doing the best acting I've I, like on the whole screen. And I'm just watching his back and I'm like, David Warner's oh back gosh. is the best actor in this episode. Like, <laughs> oh my gosh. Yeah. And this was, this was, ye was this. I guess this wouldn't have been your, no, this would have been post chain of command, right? Uh, yes. Well, I'm going to look it up or right around the same time. Right. I think it's close. 
So that aired. I'm just saying I wanted a four lights reference. Oh my gosh. Yeah. That was in 92 that that one aired. Yeah. Yeah. yeah this is like 94, right? 94, yep. 95. Yeah. I don't know if we've switched over the Christmas holiday yet or not. Yeah, I don't think that's so. where we are. So, okay. Yeah, and well, Star Trek he, six was 1991. So this is all, go. this is, yeah, this is yeah. past peak gosh, Keith Warner. He's so good. So good. Did you know he played Jor-El? Superman's yeah. father. Isn't that the, amazing? And he was also Raza. Speaking of Liam Neeson, or not Liam Neeson. Yes. Speaking of Qui Gon Jinn, played by Liam Neeson, who also played Raza Ghoul. David Warner played Raza Ghoul in the Batman Beyond series. I did not know that. Yeah. Yeah. Oh. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Yeah. That's a yeah. that's a seven degrees of separation from Liam right there. Right. Yeah. So give me two more, and I can get you to Kevin Bacon. I promise you. Uh, all right, guys, that's it. Look, Jeff, we had a 10 minute diatribe at the beginning of this episode for the folks out there talking about 20 minute diatribe in the episode. Right, right. So we're going to stop diatribing now. You guys are awesome. Like subscribe, all that sort of stuff. And, uh, we're going to get out of here for now. So thanks for watching and we'll see you guys next week as we do eyes without a face. Wait, what? How's that song? Smoke in her eyes. She's got some. What's that? Oh, that old smoky ass. I don't know. Just, just hit end. <laughs>